Well, thank you guys so much. It is a real treat for me to be here, to be back at Gilroy. I was actually here for the 16th annual Reasons to Believe, so it's good for me to be back and visit with the Hollister campus as well. I have a question for you as we get started this morning. How many of you have ever had somebody challenge your faith in such a way that it totally caught you off guard, like you didn't even see it coming? Anybody? Man, I remember the first time somebody challenged my faith like that. I was 18 years old, and I was talking with another guy I just met, teenager, a little younger than me, and we got to talking about Jesus and the Bible, and all of a sudden, somewhere in the middle of the conversation, he just stops, and he goes, look, I'm not going to base my life on a book. There is not a shred of evidence outside of this Bible that Jesus is even real. And that's where he wanted to just like drop the mic and walk away. And I'm standing there like, um, honestly, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say. Maybe you've been there too where you feel like, man, I got to say something, but I don't know what to say. Think about it. How would you respond to something like that? How would you begin to engage with somebody who wants to tune you out as soon as you reach for your Bible? or as soon as you start opening up the scriptures to show them what the Bible has to say about Jesus. Is there a way for us to talk about Jesus with people who don't see the Bible as an authority, with people who aren't maybe so comfortable starting with the Bible? Well, that is what I want to talk about today, answering the question, did Jesus exist, by looking at these sources that mention Jesus outside the Bible. And I've entitled this talk, Doubting Jesus, A Doubter's Guide to ancient non-Christian sources. Now, I have two goals here this morning. If you're a Christian here today, I want to help increase your confidence in the Bible by walking you through some of the evidence for Jesus outside the Bible so you can see how well they match up. If you're not a Christian here today or if you have your doubts about Jesus, I just want to help you get oriented to some of the ancient sources that come into play when we um, do historical Jesus conversations so that you can Get the whole story as you begin to investigate this for yourself. And also so you aren't taken in by some of these sensationalistic claims that are sometimes made about Jesus in the public square. Think about Jesus of Nazareth. Two billion people around the world, 33% of the world actually, will say that they worship him. And Christianity, the movement that's connected to Jesus' name, has had a major impact on Western civilization. In, and societies around the world, too, think about um, great works of literature, great works of art, great pieces of music. Many things in our world would be very different today if Jesus had never lived. And so the question, did Jesus exist, is a question worth thinking about because it's a real question that people have, especially because for many people today, the Bible is not the answer in their minds. For them, the Bible is the question. And so here's what we're going to do with our time together. First, I want us to talk about how historians investigate what happened in the past, just so that we can get oriented to the whole, to the whole historical approach, kind of different than the way we're normally thinking about Jesus in church. And then secondly, let's take a look at the Greco-Roman and then the Jewish sources um, that come into play when we're asking the question, did Jesus exist from a historical standpoint? Then finally, you're going to get to see how to, how to respond to and how to think through this claim that Jesus never existed at all. And some people call that the Jesus myth theory. So that's where we're going today. So how do historians figure out what happened in the past? I'll tell you a story. I did my first graduate degree in apologetics at Biola University down south. And while I was there, I got to take a class called Legal Evidence and Christian Apologetics. And as part of the class, I got to observe a whole number of court cases in Southern California. And one of the most memorable cases, I'll tell you, was this alleged vandalism case, where there was this woman who came home and she found out that her house had been trashed. Now, the defendant in the case was her ex-husband. Now, why did they think it was him? Because as they started to catalog the things that were vandalized in the house, it wasn't just anything. Only the things that she had purchased in the marriage with this guy were destroyed. So the idea is, how would anybody else know the things she purchased in the marriage with this guy versus the things she purchased outside, right? Well, there was an anomaly, too, where the vacuum cleaner was destroyed, and then they made this argument that that would just make the whole thing harder to clean up. <laughs> so this was somewhat interesting at best, but then during the recess, the prosecutor comes up to me, asks why I'm there observing the case. I tell him I'm in this class on legal evidence, but also studying world religions and worldviews, and he goes, oh, you're going to love this. You're going to love this because 
I have a Santerian priest in the back, and I'm going to put him on the stand. A Santerian priest, you say? Wow, all of a sudden things got a lot more interesting. Santeria is like this blend of West African magic and Caribbean traditions and some Christian themes thrown in the mix. And it wasn't just that her house had been vandalized. When the guy took the stand, they started talking about some weird stuff they found at the house. They found things like powder blown on one side of her bed. They found things like certain substances that were smeared on her clothing. And the Santerian priest testified under oath that these actually were parts of specific spells in the Santerian religion. And part of the reason that the woman divorced this person is because of his practice of Santeria that freaked her out quite a bit. And so this is another one of these pieces of evidence, you know, we kept adding more and more evidence to show that this person was guilty, and this led to a guilty verdict in this case. Now listen, is it possible that it wasn't him? Yeah, I mean, anything's possible, right? But the jury weighed all of the evidence, and they decided it's more likely than not that this person was guilty. And so this is how historians try to figure out what happened in the past as well. When we're dealing with history, and we're investigating history, having proof doesn't mean it's impossible to be wrong. It doesn't mean that you have to have 100% certainty. That's just not how things go when we're dealing with history and did somebody exist, did somebody do a certain thing. And so when we think about the historical Jesus, historians turn to what are called, uh, we talk about degrees of certainty in historical inquiry. It's not like when you're evaluating testimony that you have to say, oh, we can't ever be sure that somebody existed or we can't ever be sure that anything ever happened in the past. No, it's more like taking a look at the sources that we do have. We have surviving traces of past events. We take a look at those things, and we ask, how sure can we be that this thing happened just like that? Say you're reading a a particular document. Say you're reading about a traffic accident. You're reading the police report, right? How sure can we be it happened just like that? So in a court of law, you deal with something called plausibility. You look at the evidence and you ask, is it more likely than not that this thing happened? Or is it more likely than not that this thing didn't happen? Is it more likely than not that this is true or that it's not true? So that's what we mean by degrees of certainty. How sure can we be that this thing happened, that this person existed? Take the vandalism case I told you about. Even though it's possible that the eyewitnesses were lying who say they saw this guy leaving the house after the crime happened, or even though it's possible that this guy had an evil twin who also knew these Santerian spells, well, what's more likely, right? it's more likely than not that this person, in fact, committed the crime. That's what the jury found in this case. So think of historians like detectives. They study the evidence for a certain event, a certain person doing a certain thing, and some evidence will tip the scale one way, some evidence will tip the scale another way. But this is like the preponderance of evidence in court. This is how historians work, and it's the approach we're taking today with the ancient sources that we're looking at. Now, when it comes to the historical Jesus conversation, we deal with what's called the criteria of authenticity. There are a number of these things um, that historians consider when looking at data, but let me just share a couple of them with you today. The first is called multiple attestation, and the second one is called enemy attestation. What's multiple attestation? The idea of multiple attestation is that historians love to find a variety of reports about a certain thing, even if they're coming from different sources. Why? Because if more than one independent source tells you that something happened, that's a good sign that it probably happened, right? Like, let's say, what if after church today, five of you saw a car accident happen right out here on the street? Even if you guys couldn't agree on whose fault it was, the police won't think that the accident itself didn't happen, right? Nobody will say that the drivers never existed because their cars are right there in the middle of the street. And so this is what historians look for as well. We already know that the New Testament documents tell us about Jesus. Even historians who don't see the Bible as the Word of God will spend most of their time in historical Jesus conversations talking about Jesus as we read about him in the Gospels, Jesus as we read about him in the writings of Paul. But I find that many skeptics tend to perk up and get kind of more interested when I start talking about the non-Christian ancient evidence for Jesus and these non-Christian sources we're going to look at today. So that's multiple attestation. Another thing that historians consider when looking at data is something called enemy attestation. And here's why this tends to grab the attention of historians. If a writer tells us that something happened to somebody, and they say something positive, let's say, about an enemy, somebody they don't even like, and they don't gain anything by lying, well, that's a good sign that it probably happened. 
For example, what if you opened up your favorite news app and you saw that there's a video there of this, say, a Republican candidate saying about the Democratic candidate that she was running against, that that person is a brave person. That would be quite a thing, right? Why would you say something positive about the person you're running against? She could say, you know, I disagree with every single last one of her political views and policies, but I have to give this to her. If she stood up to an intruder who broke into her house, broke into her daughter's bedroom window at night, that lady's brave. Well, guess what? She's probably brave, right? Because why would you say that? And so that's the kind of thing that grabs the attention of historians. Pieces of data that fall under these two categories, uh, multiple attestation and enemy attestation. And so we're going to take a look at sources that fall under those categories today. We're going to look at things that were written by people who aren't trying to make Christianity look good. In fact, many of these sources were written by people who are outright enemies of the Christian faith. And so when we have data that falls under these two categories, multiple attestation and enemy attestation, it helps increase the probability that these things really happened. Now, hear me. It's not like just because you don't have multiple independent sources testifying to a certain thing that that thing didn't happen or that person didn't exist, or just because you don't have an enemy saying something positive about this person, it doesn't mean that that person didn't exist. But what you do have is when you have data that falls under those two categories, it helps to increase the probability that these things really happened. And so that's how historians take a look at these um, two kinds of uh, criteria of authenticity in historical Jesus conversation. But as we turn to the Greco-Roman sources, let us set our investigation in the context of ancient history. You know, Jesus seems to be the most popular person in world religion today. If you ask somebody to reel off just the top three, four, five religious figures in world religious literature, you're probably going to get Jesus somewhere in there in the top five, right? But in the first century AD, Jesus was actually not that popular of a figure in the grand scheme of things in terms of this vast Roman empire. Think about where Jesus lived. He spent most of his life tucked away in this obscure part of the Roman empire. And very few people actually knew about what was going on in that area. Think about this. If you grab the USA Today today, like the actual newspaper, a big thick newspaper, and you went looking in that paper for a story about one of my friends who is doing ministry in Guam, what are the chances you're going to find something in USA Today about that person? Very little, right? Now think about that. Guam is a territory of the United States. And yet how many of us know what's going on in Guam right now, unless you have a personal connection to somebody there? Well, in that same way, there were millions of people who lived in the ancient world that we know absolutely nothing about today because nobody wrote anything about them. They just weren't that much of a thing to Rome to write about. And so it's amazing there's any mention about Jesus at all outside the Bible. So what do the Greco-Roman sources tell us about Jesus? Well, there are three sources that mention the effect that Jesus had on society. And then there are three sources that mention Jesus directly. This is just a good place to start where, uh, in terms of examining the sources. Is let's start with these three sources to talk about the effect Jesus had on society. First up is a guy named Suetonius. Suetonius was a Roman historian, and he wrote about the lives of Roman emperors. And one of his books was a biography of the emperor Claudius, the Roman emperor Claudius. He started ruling in 41 AD. And there's a part where he talks about how Claudius kicked the Jews out of Rome. He says this, Because the Jews at Rome caused continuous disturbances at the instigation of Crestus, he, that's Claudius, expelled them from the city. Now, interesting, this detail about Claudius kicking Jews out of Rome actually shows up in the Bible. It shows up in Acts chapter 18. You see, in AD 49, there was apparently a huge public uproar about uh, this person named Jesus who was believed to be the Jewish Messiah. And so this kind of caught the attention of the Roman government. Many historians think that Crestus here is just a different spelling of the title Christ, and he's really talking about Jesus. Now, Crestus was a common Gentile name, but it wasn't a common Jewish name. So it wasn't very likely that Jews were causing a ruckus because of a Jewish person named Crestus. No, this is probably talking about Christ, but Suetonius spelled uh, Christus with an E because that's the way he was used to spelling this common Gentile name. Like, my name is Mikkel, and it's spelled M-I-K-E-L. 
But at Dallas Theological Seminary, there was a person who used to work there in the same department that I work now, whose name was also Mikkel, but she spelled her name with an E at the end. And so, of course, when I started working at Dallas Seminary, I started getting these emails from somebody who remembers this person, and she would always spell my name with an E at the end. It wasn't just one time. So eventually I asked her about it, and I said, why do you always spell my name with an E at the end? And she said, oh, yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. There was this girl who actually used to work in your exact department, and that's why. So that is very understandable that when you come across an, a similar-sounding name, that you would spell the name the way you're used to spelling it. So that is, I think, what's going on with Suetonius here. But the point is, Suetonius is not a Christian. And in fact, he kind of paints Jesus as a troublemaker here. Like, these Jews were causing a ruckus because of this person. They were troublemakers. And Jesus was a troublemaker, too. But it's connected. He's, he's showing this evidence for a Jewish movement that's connected to Jesus that had become enough of a thing by AD 49 to grab the attention of the Roman government. Second up is a Roman writer known as Pliny the Younger. And from 111 to 113 AD, he was the governor of a place called Bithynia, which is where Turkey is now. Certainly no friend of Christianity. In fact, he called Christianity an evil superstition. He had no problem killing Christians. But then he wrote, an emperor, or he wrote a letter to the emperor Trajan. And in his letter to the emperor Trajan, he says that Christians would meet up super early in the morning and they would sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a god. Now, this is evidence not only of the early worship of Jesus, but this idea that Jesus was believed to be divine very early and in a monotheistic Jewish context. That's quite a thing. And so here we have this mention of what Christians would do. But Pliny thought that this was bizarre because he knew full well that Jesus was a human person who was put on the cross and was publicly executed by the Roman government. And now you're singing songs to him like he's a god? That's weird. Now, Pliny tried to force Christians to... Uh, reject Jesus, to renounce their faith, and he did that by trying to make them curse Jesus. But in Pliny's mind, you didn't curse gods, you only cursed people. And so this is evidence that Pliny believed that Jesus was a real human person. Third one is a second century Greek writer by the name of Lucian of Samosata. And he was not a stand-up comedian, but he actually liked to make fun of people, and he liked to make fun of Christians. And so he says that Christians worship a crucified man, and that was kind of the, the, the joke in this particular case. But he says, the Christians, you know, worship a man to this day, that distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. There's actually a piece of Roman graffiti that shows a person worshiping a man on a cross, and they, they add like a, a horse head, like a donkey head there, and that was kind of the, the joke that these Romans were making. Um, it's an interesting graphic. It's not one I would show in church, but it's really an interesting piece of historical evidence. Well, when you talk about Lucian of Samosata, he used a different word for crucifixion here than this, the word that's in the Bible. And so some people think he's citing an independent source, an independent tradition. But the main point is that he never argued that Jesus didn't exist. All these people who are enemies of the Christian faith, nobody argued that Jesus was totally made up, that he was a myth that Jesus was never even born. So these three sources at least give us a glimpse into the effect that Jesus had. They tell us about an early Jewish movement based on the idea that Jesus was the Messiah and that Jesus uh, was being worshipped as a deity shortly after his public execution on the cross. But beyond just the effect that Jesus had on people, we also have sources that mention Jesus directly. So we want to turn to those right now. There's a Greek philosopher by the name of Celsus, and Celsus wrote around 175 AD. He was a pretty strong opponent of the Christian faith. He said Jesus, get this, he says Jesus used Egyptian magic to do his miracles. So he was trying to kind of slam Jesus here by saying that Jesus was hired out to go to Egypt. While there, he acquired magical powers to razzle-dazzle his friends back in Israel. Now listen, even in trying to make Jesus look bad, he, one, doesn't say Jesus didn't exist, and two, admits Jesus did miracles. He's just trying to explain where he got the power. So he's making up this stuff, trying to make Jesus look bad, and yet it's testimony to Jesus as a real person who is really known as a miracle worker. Even today, historians who don't believe that miracles are even possible will say the idea that Jesus was known as a miracle worker is a historical fact. Because people who saw him perceived what he was doing as miracles. 
Jesus did things that both he and his followers and even those enemies perceived as actual miracles. There's another philosopher by the name of Mara Bar Serapion from Syria, and he wrote a letter to his son shortly after Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, and he wrote this, what advantage came to the Jews by the murder of their wise king? He called Jesus a wise king of the Jews. He also called Jesus a martyr and a teacher. And then he started comparing Jesus to other human figures like Socrates. He said, Socrates was a wise man. He was a teacher. He was martyred. Jesus was a wise man. Jesus was a teacher, and he was martyred too. And so he kind of compares Jesus to these other figures who are also human persons. Now, if you remember any of these sources that we've mentioned today as far as the Greco-Roman sources, remember this one, this one. The most important of the Greco-Roman sources is a man named Tacitus. Tacitus is a Roman senator. He was a historian, and he's probably the best historian that ancient Rome ever had. But he called Christianity a disease, and he hated Christians. Now, let me give you the backstory to an important quote that you need to see. In AD 64, there was a huge fire that broke out in Rome. Some of you know about the fire that broke out in Rome. More than half the city went up in flames. A lot of people think Nero was actually behind the fire. But Tacitus tells us that Nero tried to pin it on the Christians. Here's what Nero wrote. I'm sorry, uh, here's what uh, Tacitus wrote about Nero in the Annals of Imperial Rome. He says, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Then he says, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty, that's crucifixion, during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. And a most mischievous superstition again broke out not only in Judea, but even in Rome. That's a Roman historian talking about a Roman governor. And he says that Pontius Pilate had Jesus crucified during the reign of Tiberius Caesar, exactly where the Bible says it happened. You can read in Luke, Luke 1, verse 3, where uh, Luke puts it during the reign of Tiberius Caesar when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea. This is the time that Jesus lived. It's not during the reign of Caesar Augustus. It's not during the reign of Claudius. Luke puts the gospel uh, squarely in history with these markers, and it lines up very well with what we see with sources outside of the Bible. But let's transition now from the Greco-Roman sources to the Jewish evidence for Jesus. There's an important Jewish historian named Josephus, and we're going to spend some time talking about his contribution to historical Jesus conversation. Well, who was Josephus? Well, he was actually a general who fought against the Romans, and in AD 67, he was defeated at Gamla. A couple weeks ago, uh, Craig Evans showed you a picture of some ruins at Gamla, if you remember that. Well, shortly after he was defeated, he started to write to explain Judaism to the Romans. He produced this massive work called The Antiquities of the Jews. It's a 20-volume set. And it's basically his take on Jewish history starting in Genesis 1 all the way up to his present time. Well, if you read Book 18, in Units 63 and 64, you can read a first-century non-Christian Jewish testimony to Jesus. And I want to walk through this text together with you. Josephus writes, There was about this time Jesus, a wise man. Now let me explain the brackets. In the brackets are things that Josephus probably did not write. Because Josephus was a Jew. He was not a follower of Jesus. He was not a Messianic Jew. And so there are certain things in here that don't sound like things Jewish people would write. Even though he was a Jew, the existing copies of his work were written by Christian scribes, and it seems like they added a few things. Maybe they didn't feel comfortable writing only what Josephus wrote about Jesus. Maybe they wanted to fill out some of the detail with what they believed about Jesus. But the point is that these things are very easy to spot, and so we can put them in the brackets here. The text goes on, if it be lawful to call him a man. Well, that kind of makes it sound like he's more than a man, right? But if you're Jewish, like Josephus, you're not going to write that. And so most historians recognize this bit about if it be lawful to call him a man actually doesn't go back to Josephus, but a lot of the other parts of this passage actually do. Take a look at the next section. For he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as receive the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. 
Now, that's another addition that we put in the brackets there because, again, as a Jewish person, he's not going to say Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, but he probably wrote something like, he was called the Christ. He was called the Christ. And keep that in mind because we're going to come back to that in just a minute. And Pilate, he goes on, and when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. Now, don't miss this. This is a first century Jewish historian writing about the Jewish role in Jesus' death. And he says it's that some of the Jewish leaders had a hand in this. Some of our own people, he says, are the ones who put Pilate up to this. And this is exactly what we read in the Gospels. You can look at Mark 14, for example, and read about Jesus' Jewish examination at his trial before he was publicly executed. Then there's another bracketed section. For he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. That's not Josephus. And the tribe of Christians, look at the last part, the tribe of Christians so named for him are not extinct at this day. Well, that's not a problem. Josephus knew about the movement that was linked to Jesus' name, and it actually seems like he's kind of surprised here that they're even still around. And so what you get here in this passage that we've read is the core of what Josephus wrote with some annotations from a Christian scribe. Now check this out. He was a doer of wonderful works. Remember that part? Josephus wrote in Greek. First time I ever opened up Josephus' antiquities, I'm like, wow, it's in Greek. I thought Josephus was a Jew. I thought he would write in Hebrew, right? But he's writing in Greek. Remember, he's writing for the Romans to help them understand Judaism. And when he talks about Jesus as doing wonderful works, that word wonderful there is the Greek word paradoxon. And it's kind of like, We get, it sounds like the English word paradox, right? But this meant amazing things, unusual things, strange things. Jesus was known for the kinds of unusual and surprising things that he did. Now, some people know about the discussion surrounding this text and and the brackets and all that. Some people don't, though. And many people have gotten this idea that the whole passage in Josephus about Jesus was forged, and none of it goes back to Josephus. So let me make a suggestion If you're sharing this with somebody and they tell you that you can't use Josephus as a source because that part where he mentions Jesus is a total forgery, ask them this question, which one? Which one? Because besides the mention of Jesus in book 18, Josephus mentions Jesus again in book 20. Remember, this is a 20-volume work, and he has another opportunity to mention Jesus when he talks about Jesus' brother, James, and how he was killed. Take a look at this. He says, A man named Jesus, I'm sorry, uh, a man named James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, was put on trial in Jerusalem. Now, there's no controversy about this one. This is in book 20, section 200. There's no controversy about this one. Historians love to find things like this where he is just um, mentioning Jesus to explain who James is. He's just explaining who James is by connecting him to his more famous brother. And it's interesting, this is really kind of different than the way that Christians would refer to James as the brother of the Lord. Here he says, James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ. Remember in book 18, he was called the Christ? It's like he was saying, you remember how I wrote about this guy, this Jesus back in book 18, the one who did all this amazing, wonderful works, strange, unusual things? The Jesus, who was called the Christ? That guy, that guy. And so when it comes to Josephus, Most historians recognize that when you take away the edits that got into the text sometime in the 8th century or earlier, that we have this historical core that's evidence of Jesus outside the Bible. And this from a Jewish historian writing about the Jewish role in Jesus' death. You also see this in the Jewish Talmud. It's a later source, but you still see this idea that Jesus was crucified. It says, on the eve of the Passover, Yeshu was hanged. And this is a, a euphemism for crucifixion. Something else that we know about Jesus from the Jewish Talmud and from Jewish tradition is that he was believed to have done miracles. Jewish people had called him a sorcerer, had called him a magician, because they did not deny the fact that Jesus did miracles. Again, there's no ancient source that says, we don't know if Jesus did miracles or not. There's no source that says he faked his miracles. You know what the question of the day was? Where did the power come from? The question was, where did the power come from? There were only two options in the minds of ancient people. The power either came from above or it came from below. Nobody questioned if Jesus did any miracles. 
They debated over where the power came from. And so this is evidence that Jesus was, in fact, known for the surprising things that he did. These were the options on the table. Some people thought that Jesus was from God. Other people thought he wasn't. But either way, there's no ancient evidence that people who opposed Christianity said he never lived, he never existed. Everybody knew that Jesus was for real. Now, when you take this data that we've looked at from the Greco-Roman sources, from the Jewish sources, you put them together, you can kind of build an, uh, an outline sketch of the life of Jesus that we read inside the Bible. You'd know about a man if all you looked at was sources outside the Bible. You'd read about a real person named Jesus, but look at what else you'd see. You'd learn about the place of his ministry. In Galilee, in Judea, you'd read about the timing of his ministry during Pontius Pilate's time. And you can put that solidly between AD 26 and 36 when Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea. Um, we all even know the name of his brother, James, right? We read about James in Josephus. Also, his reputation as a wise man, his reputation as a teacher, and his reputation as a miracle worker. Isn't that amazing? Even before we get to the Bible, just taking a look at the sources outside the Bible, we can find out more than just there was a person named Jesus. But all this, but there's more, because we also know about his reputation as the Christ, right? The Jewish Messiah. Also, his kingly status in the eyes of some people. Also, we know about his death by crucifixion, the involvement of the Roman government in his death, the involvement of some Jewish leaders in his death, and the movement that worshipped him as a deity after he was publicly executed on the cross. So the sources outside the Bible, they line up very well with key facts that we know about Jesus from inside the Bible. For example, one of the bedrock facts about the historical Jesus that virtually every critical historian can agree upon is that Jesus was really crucified. Jesus was a real person who was publicly crucified by the Roman government. Even a skeptical scholar, for example, by the name of John Dominic Crossan, who is somebody who believes that we can't really trust most of what the Gospels tell us about Jesus, he says Jesus is definitely for real. He was a real person, and he was really crucified. John Dominic Crossan says that he was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be. Another uh, late uh, scholar who um, has a similar quote, quote is Marcus Borg. He's another one who was part of the skeptical Jesus seminar. And so what we see here is that the Greco-Roman sources and the Jewish sources, they go hand in hand. They go hand in hand to help us build a case for a real historical Jesus even before getting to the Bible. Now, a lot of people have not heard about these sources, but they have heard about something called the Jesus myth theory. They've heard people say that Jesus never existed at all that somehow Jesus' story was made up by the early church, that he, it was copied or patterned after some pagan myths. And so they begin to get interested in this Jesus myth theory. But the idea that Jesus never existed at all isn't taken very, very seriously by historians today. I mean, it's kind of like saying that the Holocaust never happened or that 9-11 never happened. Uh, we never put a man on the moon. This is conspiracy theory stuff. And yet there are many people who really like this idea that Jesus was made up and that his story was copied and patterned after these stories of pagan gods. And you'll see them on YouTube, you'll see them on TV around Christmas and Easter time and popular magazines too. So let me just mention three problems with this way of approaching the historical Jesus conversation so you can see why historians don't take this very seriously. First, the Jesus myth idea commits a kind of logical fallacy called post hoc for short. And that is to say that just because something comes after something else, it doesn't automatically mean that the older thing caused the newer thing. Like if you actually found a pagan myth that kind of sounds like the story of Jesus where there's parallels and there really aren't any, it doesn't mean that the older pagan stories automatically influenced the Jesus story or that the Jesus story was entirely made up, patterned after these myths. I really like how Mike Lycona illustrates this. He says, I'm thinking of a plane that took off around... 9 o'clock in the morning, just after 9 o'clock in the morning from Massachusetts. And shortly after 10 o'clock in the morning, this plane slammed into one of the tallest buildings in the world in New York. And it hit between the uh, 78th and 80th floors, and everyone on the plane died. But I'm not talking about the 767 that flew into the South Tower on 9-11. No, I'm talking about a B-52 that hit the Empire State Building 
on June 28, 1945. Imagine that. Both planes even hit the same floors of these different buildings. Now, how crazy would it be to say, oh, 9-11 obviously didn't happen. That whole South Tower plane thing was just a ripoff of this older story. Who does history like that? Nobody. And yet this is the kind of thing that the Jesus myth theory people want us to take seriously. But nobody takes this kind of thing seriously in historical research. So that's the first problem, assuming that an older story automatically influenced a newer story. The second problem is this. When you take a look at these alleged parallels, they're nothing at all like Jesus. Sometimes people will say, hey, Mikhail, there are these stories I've read about pagan gods, and they kind of sound like Jesus because I read about them in this book or I saw this on YouTube. And if you go to actually look at the real stories, the, the original sources, there is no comparison at all to Jesus. For example, there's a popular conspiracy video on YouTube called Zeitgeist by a, by a guy named Peter Joseph, and it's been out for over a decade. It still gets a lot of attention. Well, in this video, part of it says that the story of Jesus' virgin birth, his virginal conception, was copied from a variety of other gods and that many other gods were also said to have been born of a virgin. He gives an example, Horus, for example, from Egyptian mythology. So I looked into this. If you bother to even just read and track down the actual story, you won't find any pagan parallels to Jesus' virginal conception at all. Take Horus, for example. In Egyptian mythology, Horus looks like a guy with a falcon head. Now, his mother was a goddess named Isis, and she kind of shows up as a bird sometimes. But she was already married to this green god by the name of Osiris before she gave birth to Horus. And in fact, the best uh, testimony to this myth, um, it's called the Great Hymn of Osiris, tells us that Horus was not born of a virgin. It actually says that Isis and Osiris had sex. This is the total opposite of a virginal conception. The whole story is very weird, actually. It's quite... It's quite remarkable. It's, it's a, quite a thing. Very weird. But it is the total opposite of a virginal conception. It has nothing to do with the story of Jesus. It looks nothing at all. There is no parallel there at all. So that whole alleged parallel thing was just a total lie. But doing this kind of thing, just making up total lies about other religions to kind of make this conspiracy theory about Jesus work, is not a new thing. I'll give you another example. About 100 years ago, there was a guy named Kersey Graves who wrote a book called The World's 16 Crucified Saviors. That's quite a title, huh? But he sold a lot of books just on the title. Well, on page uh, 140, he said that the Hindu god Krishna was crucified between two thieves. Like, really? Wow, that'd be quite a thing, right? If it was actually true. So I went and I tracked down the original Indian poem. And do you want to know how Krishna died? He got shot in a hunting accident. Really, a hunter thought he was a deer and shot him in the foot with an arrow. But the way I've heard this thing posed to me is like, Mikhail, there's uncanny similarities here. Like, I mean, Jesus was pierced and then he died, and then Krishna was pierced and then he died. Like, well, okay, one, that's kind of vague. And two, if you actually read the story, right, somebody shot him in the foot with an arrow. But these are the kinds of things, these are kind of the vague ways that people have to describe these parallels to have them even make sense or have them, you know, catch your attention. You know what I like to say is that all things are similar. All things are similar if you ignore the differences. <laughs> you can tweet that if you want. So that's the second problem. These alleged parallels, so many of them are just outright lies. Or you have to cherry pick and just start taking things from different religions and saying, okay, when you put them all together, it's kind of a, con a conglomeration, right, of the Jesus story. But these things are just outright lies. Third, think about who these... Jewish believers actually were. They were pious Jews, and pious Jews rejected paganism. These pious Jews were the earliest Christians, and they cared an awful lot about Jewish laws. Think about this. They sat around really contemplating, can you, as a, good, as a Christian in good conscience, eat meat that had been sacrificed to idols of these pagan gods? Now, if that's the kind of thing that you're thinking about, could you imagine these exact same Christians borrowing from pagan myths in order to form the foundation of their own religion? Not likely. The Jesus story was not made up or manufactured to be attractive to Jews or Gentiles. It wasn't like they said, hey, you guys, I know it would make people want to sign up for the Jewish, this, uh, this new Jewish movement called Christianity if we make Jesus sound a bunch, like a bunch of those pagan gods. No, that's not going to work. Look at what the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1.23. 
He says this, We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. This Jesus story was not made up to make it more attractive to Jews, to make it more attractive to Gentiles. The only reason you would say Jesus was crucified is if he actually was. Now I want you to take a look at this. Take a look at the cross. The cross is one of the most recognized symbols in the world. It's kind of like the logo of Christianity. And yet, in the first century AD, the word for cross was not a word you would bring up in polite company. It's not something you would just start talking about in front of your young kids or your grandma. The whole thing was just way too brutal. It would bring up images of these tortured, bloodied corpses hanging there in public. The whole thing was just way too extreme. And yet, it is a historical fact that early Christians made the cross their symbol from the beginning. Why? Because for them, the cross was a symbol of Jesus' love for them, a real person who really loved them and really died for them. Without a real historical Jesus, how can you explain that? There is an agnostic historian by the name of Bart Ehrman. He has atheist leanings. He's probably the most popular of the skeptical New Testament scholars. Um, some of you who are in college will probably read his, his books um, in your New Testament classes. But listen to what he said in an interview to the Huffington Post. He said this, The earliest followers of Jesus declared that he was a crucified Messiah because they believed specifically that Jesus was the Messiah and they knew full well that he was crucified. Then I love this part. One may well choose to resonate with the concerns of our modern and postmodern cultural despisers of established religion or not, but surely the best way to promote such an agenda is not to deny what virtually every sane historian on the planet, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, pagan, agnostic, atheist, what have you, has come to conclude based on a range of compelling historical evidence. Then he says, whether we like it or not, Jesus certainly existed. This is an agnostic historian with atheist leanings who could care less if there was a real Jesus or not. It'd make no difference to him. But the existence of Jesus is a historical fact. Jesus is definitely for real. Well, you remember that conversation that I had with the guy I met in high school. He told me, there is not a shred of evidence outside this Bible that Jesus is even real. You see, for him, the Bible wasn't the answer in his mind. For him, the Bible was the question. And that's where a lot of our skeptical friends, our skeptical family members and coworkers, that's where a lot of them are today. And so maybe instead of telling people it's true because it's in the Bible, we should consider switching it up and making a little move to, tell, to say maybe we can help them consider that it's in the Bible because it's actually true. It's in the Bible because it's actually true. When it comes to the historical evidence, Jesus of Nazareth is one of the best attested Jews of the entire first century. We can be quite certain that Jesus existed and that Jesus impacted the world. And interestingly, the sources outside the Bible give us a nice outline sketch of the life of Jesus that we read inside the Bible. And so if you're here today and you have your doubts about Jesus, my challenge to you is to take the next step, to read the New Testament Gospels to see where the portrait of Jesus actually comes from, to see how he impacted lives, to see how he impacted people who had their doubts about him, people like Thomas who had their doubts about him, one of his own followers, people like Saul of Tarsus, the skeptic, the critic. So get to know these sources. Look into the evidence for yourself so that you can have the whole story and so you can get to know the man behind the sources. Thanks. I'm going to call the worship team back up, and as the worship team is coming right back up, I want to give you a website to check out. If you're interested, you can download the notes from this particular presentation at apologeticsguide.com slash doubtingjesus. You can get the notes from this presentation. You can also get the five um, books that I recommend for you to begin your particular search for uh, the historical Jesus and do your own study, whether you're looking for... Um, sources anybody can get, or whether you're looking to some more academic sources, including uh, the atheist who wrote the book, Did Jesus Exist? Bart Ehrman. So you can check that out. Thanks again so much. God bless you guys.